Okay, good morning everyone and thank you all for joining us for our Beef Brunch Educational Series News Update on Tuesday, May 25th. My name is Ashley Edwards and with me are Vince Desitel, Jason Holmes, and Lee Falk. Um, I think we've got a pretty good, pretty good lineup of information for y'all today. Uh, you know, we always go over the markets, but um, we're really going to go into input costs as well as markets and what we're seeing in terms of fertilizer and cattle and everything. Um, but as usual, to kick us off, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Lee uh, for our update in the Northwest region. I think you said you were out trying to get some hay up today before we see rain again later this week. Uh, yes, Ashley, glad to be with everyone today. Uh, it, it, it's really continued to be wet up in our part of the world. We've had a few days of drying, nothing near uh, as bad as what Vince and, and everybody in South Louisiana has been experiencing as far as as uh, rainfall goes and flooding. Uh, heart goes out to the folks around Lake Charles. Boy, you talk about a community and, and a part of the state that's really had it tough the last uh, last year and a half, two years or so. It's it's really been difficult for those folks down there. So heart goes out to them. But we, we we've had off and on rains, I guess, for the last week or two, uh, mainly on rather than off. Uh, we've had quite a bit of uh, of uh, rain, like I said, and and just enough to where it's kind of stalled out any hay production. You know, hey, Ashley's correct. We we cut some hay down thinking uh, this past weekend, thinking that we were going to have a good stretch of drying and um, only to realize that rain's back in the forecast in the big way several days this week. And that's been the story of it. Uh, just cannot get in the field, can't get a long enough time frame where you can get out there and get that hay cut and dried. And the folks uh, in the flatlands over in the Red River Valley, uh, uh, they're really suffering, of course, uh, poor drainage and whatnot. Uh, even when they do get a three or four day break whenever uh, they might be able to get some hay dried. And I talked to a guy this morning. In fact, he he told me that uh, you know they'd love to cut some, but uh, they have to have rubber boots on still when they're walking across hay field. And, uh, so just about the time whenever the hay fields start drying up a little bit, they come in to come into some more moisture there. So it, it is a challenging time. It'll come to an end soon, and uh, probably here in another month or so, we'll be hollering wanting some rain, but. That's not the way it is right now, for sure. Um, as far as ryegrass goes and, and clover and everything, we're, we're drawing pretty close to the end on this stuff. Uh, I was uh, at the Hill Farm Research Station this morning and going over some uh, ryegrass and cereal rye uh, fields that we've got there and walking them. And, and you can tell it's just uh, towards the end there. Uh, the, the, there's still a good amount of forage there, but it's starting to become unpalatable to the cattle there. They're a little bit more restless, wanting to be moved, wanting to find some fresher grass, some Bermuda or, or whatnot, maybe some Bahia that's come up. But uh, anyway, we're getting towards the tail end on that. And as we drive around the country, we see a lot of that going on. A lot of folks pulling uh, cattle off ryegrass and winter pastures. Um, the folks that's got the, the stalker grazers out there, the yearlings, uh, they're really in a mess right now with what's going on with the markets. They've held out and held out and the weather's cooperated with them plus size we've been able to extend this winter grazing season a little bit um, the markets being as tumultuous as they are it's it's giving people hope that if i can hold on just a little while longer things will turn around and so far they hadn't and so the people are really getting down to crunch time and and you know they, they might be able to last a little longer with some cattle out, out on these winter pastures but uh, before too long, the, the bloom will be off these cattle and, and the, they'll start to show it and uh, they're going to have to make a decision one way or another. Um, I can't, th I, I, whenever I was preparing for my little segment on this, this thing, I, I got to thinking about all this going on in the cattle industry right now. And I don't think there's ever been a time in, in my lifetime where there was aside from maybe the mad cow disease outbreaks or what have you, when there's been so much to talk about and it's, it's so many choices that can't really even get into them. It, it, and most of them center, center around markets right now. And of course we, we try not to take sides or not stand on any soapboxes and I'm not going to do that today, but 
uh, if you don't have a reliable source, uh, some somewhere where you're picking up on some daily market news and and industry news, I guess you would say, I, I highly encourage you to reach out to one of us, and we'll we'll point you in the direction. There there is so much happening on a daily basis. There were several big stories that uh that that broke last week. Uh, one of the last ones I saw was uh, JBS, one one of the nation's largest. Uh, beef uh, packing companies um, made a decision to pull out of the uh, National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Uh, th th there's tons of stuff going on and, and news in, in our industry. And I know I went over this last time we talked, but I, I, I just want to drive the point home that if you're not a member of an association, uh, if you're not getting uh, reliable uh, unbiased information on what's going on day to day in the in the industry you really need to highly consider that and and there's a lot out there a lot of information out there and i, I highly enc encourage you to educate yourself because these are uh, momentous times when it comes to the beef industry in my view and 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 the cattle industry where we're headed as an industry i firmly believe that uh the next few months is going to greatly shape our our interest um uh, uh, in, in, in uh, our uh, our industry uh, for the next 10 years or better. So um, with that being said, that's what's going on around here. We're just waiting a little dry weather to make some hay and uh, hopefully it'll dry out soon. Hopefully we can avoid any more flood and rains and, and, and whatnot. And with that, Ashley, I, I, I'll wrap her up. All right, thank you. Vince, I know it's wet really 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 wet um but how i mean how are things looking is there any any promise other than your you know drought that you posted you were having on saturday no unfortunately ashley and thank you all for having me but um you know we we had rain uh starting last sunday night uh through thursday um you know as lee mentioned i'm 80 or so miles from from lake charles 80 or so miles from baton rouge 50 miles from lafayette and I mean, it ranged from six, seven inches in some spots up to 15 inches in some places. Um, just amazing the amount of water uh, that people are faced with. I've had a couple of calls about people wanting to move cattle uh, that are south of Highway 14 up above. Um, you know, that you know, when, the, when the marshes start flooding. Um, but the ironic thing is I talked to people down in, you know, below the intercoastal and, and they had half an inch of rain. So... It was kind of between I-10 and the intercoastal, and it was just, it was just overwhelming. Um, but you know, with with that being said, you know, as far as field conditions, what's going on locally, um, we still got some late season cow workings going on because of the wet conditions and pens. Uh, people are just not, you know, catching animals to bring them in to uh, tear up their facilities and their 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 groundwork around their pens. Uh, but some of that is still going on. Um, Ryegrass and clover is unprecedented how, how long it's held on. Uh, I've had numerous people tell me that, you know, they've had the best ryegrass this year than they've had ever before. I said, well, that's uh, due in part to the, you know, cool, uh, wet temperatures, uh, conditions that we've had. So um, just an abundance of clover out there this year and uh, cattle are really starting to shine up, but we need some warmer temperatures. Uh, it's it's been too wet too cold uh, we had in where i'm located we had slightly over eight inches of rain uh this past week uh two weeks ago we had 10 inches of rain it's been amazing in the last three weeks we've had more than 20 inches of rain um so it's time for it to quit we've missed our first cutting of hay in general for all of the south um you know we had a, a little bit of baleage that went in about three weeks ago uh, we had a few days of sunshine uh, it was predicted this week, as Lee mentioned, good weather all week. You know, there were 10 days of, of sun and, and, you know, some partly cloudiness on the, on the weather forecast. We wake up at daylight this morning, it's sprinkling raining. So um, I know that has a lot to do with what's going on in the Gulf. We had a little tropical disturbance that went into Texas, uh, central part of Texas uh, coast uh, during the weekend. And that's just some stuff streaming from it. But it's just antagonizing the situation that we're, we're just persistently wet. Um, as I touch on the crop situation, we have a lot of diverse crop area down here. Uh, sugar cane has still not worked. Soybeans, hundreds of thousands of acres of soybeans not planted. We're approaching the last planting date, June 15th, for FSA purposes. Uh, 
There's people getting awfully uptight with, with seed in the warehouse, uh, tractors and equipment parked. We have a little bit of grain sorghum that got planted. It looks like hell. Uh, just nothing, nothing growing. I mean, um, I, I worked in the industry. I've been in the industry 30 years, and it's 1990 or 91. I can't remember a season since since then like we have this year. Um, I, I don't know where this is going, but as far as the market, those that are getting good calves to the market, as I mentioned in our conversation before we started, um, I sold some personally five weight steers last week that brought a buck fifty. I was tickled to death with that, you know, this year compared to last year. Um, but the good cattle, you know, are still bringing good money. Uh, the lower ended cattle, are, are, are cheap, you know, I mean they're cheap. So uh, as Jason and I and Lee spoke of earlier, cow calf pairs, bred cows, those that got some conditioning on them, and uh, look like they have a future with with a producer. They're paying some good money for them at the sale of barns right now. So um, Jason's going to cover on some of the cost cost effectiveness of doing business today. Uh, just be cautious of, of what, you, what you purchase. Uh, if it's at the sale barn, we need the sale barns, but if it's at the sale barns, it's got an issue. So uh, with that, uh, we're just going to hope and pray for some drier conditions uh, moving forward. Here we are the first of, approaching first of June. And I mean, there's there is not a baler that has come out of the barn to speak of anywhere south of Alexandria and Alexandria South has been extremely, extremely wet the last, you know, all spring. So that's all I have today. Thank you. And I mean, I know you kind of just led into what Jason's got talking about cost effectiveness and some things that we can can do. Um, control as much as we can, I guess, moving forward when there's so much uncertainty that just keeps popping up and as most of you know, we started these news updates last year when COVID hit um, as a way to, to reach out to everyone, um, but also to keep providing updates because it just, it seemed like there was one of those black swan events that we keep calling them one after another. And I think I was very optimistic when 2020 was gonna, gonna conclude that 2021 was gonna be so much better. And I don't know that it has been, um, it's just been, been very tough. And so um, I hope that Y'all are hearing some repetitiveness on these news updates, and that's because, you know, a lot of these practices, a lot of these things that we're trying to to get out to you during these tough times um, are things that have, that have helped in the past and that will hopefully continue to help. And so with that, I'm turning it over to Jason, um, go into our Northeast region update, but also, um, as we said already, talk about how to be as cost effective as possible and then what our markets are looking like. All right, thank you, ma'am. So we'll get into uh, what our field conditions and um, uh, as Vince uh, uh, reached out to uh, Dennis Burns and Carol Allison and, and uh, some of our counterparts over on the northeast side of the state, just to uh, to get a grasp on what some of our uh, crops look like. Uh, as as Vince said, we're pretty diversified over on this this east side and that Delta region. Um, so before I get into pastures, I'll just kind of tell you what they said. So um, uh, just about all of the soybean and cotton planting will get wrapped up by the end of this week. Um, uh, Dennis Burns was telling me he had one producer uh, with uh, uh, four 12 row planters sitting on the edge of the field, just waiting on the conditions to get right uh, to finish up some uh, finish up some soybean planting. Uh, right now, they're sitting at about 80 percent of the crop, uh, 75 to 80 percent of the soybean crop that's in the ground. Um, um, so on the on the western side, about 50% of the cotton, uh, as you get over towards the Mississippi River, about 80% of that cotton is in the ground. Uh, all of the corn uh, looks really good. That was the resounding message that uh, that the corn crop looks looks really good. Um, I got about 10% of it that's tasseling right now, so that's uh, that's good. And and I guess I'll just remind everybody the reason. We talk about a little bit, Vince is always very good about visiting about the crops a little bit is, and we try to touch on the the ones that are important to us on the livestock side, uh, because we feed a good bit of that product in the in the livestock industry. So uh, I think it's important for us to keep up with, with what's happening there. Uh, so the resounding message on the pasture conditions is, is that they're wet. Uh, as you get over towards uh, uh, towards that delta, the cattle are bogged up to their knees uh, in mud and across some of those pastures, which is uh, it's not good for them. It's not good for the pastures. Uh, tears up pastures. 
Um, uh, so that that's an issue. The other issue is, and it uh, across everybody that I've talked to is trying to figure out what to do with this all of this ryegrass. I mean, you've heard us talk about ryegrass now for the last month. I mean, we had an excellent ryegrass season, and now folks are trying to figure out what to do with all of that excess uh, forage that's standing out there. So we're to the point now to where nutritional value just really isn't uh, much, um, and that uh, that grass is really matured, and we know with maturity, nutritional quality uh, declines rapidly. But we have to get that off of there. It's not going to allow these warm season perennials to uh, to go ahead and emerge and green up. So it is these moisture conditions, high moisture conditions are definitely causing some some issues across the board. I want to visit just briefly about uh, uh, some of these input costs that we're seeing. Um, and uh, as we as we get towards the end of this, uh, um, we were talking about it may just be where Lee and Vince chime in and we just have a conversation about some of these things that we're seeing and and some of the recommendations that we might be able to do to help mitigate some of these costs. The first one I'm going to talk about is fuel prices. So uh, we're looking at a 33% increase over last year on our dyed diesel fuel. Um, and, and I guess to digress real quick, so uh, feed fertilizer, fuel, so feed being purchased feed, but also stored hay, um, fertilizer and fuel. So those those are our biggest input costs uh, in this in the cow-calf um, um, industry in the state of Louisiana. So those, I guess, are the ones that I'll, I'll touch on the most. So the first one, 33% increase in dyed diesel fuel. Uh, the second one, uh, retail fertilizer prices. So we're continuing to see month over month uh, increases in those fertilizer prices. I'm I'm not going to quote prices today, <laughs> uh, and it's uh, that that's too volatile for me to start quoting prices. But I will tell you what we're seeing in terms of increases. Uh, so they have dramatically increased from last year. I think Lee said it best. And one of our previous updates that whenever you do call the the retailer that you get your fertilizer from, please make sure you're sitting down whenever you make that call, uh, because uh, it's liable to knock you to your knees whenever you do hear it. Um, um, prices for uh, mono uh, monoammonium phosphate, diammonium phosphate, and UAN28, so that's a 28% nitrogen, are higher by 62% and 53% respectively. So MAP and uh, up 62%, DAP and UAN 28 up 53% respectively compared to a year ago. Uh, anhydrous ammonia and UAN 32, that 32% nitrogen are up 45% higher than a year ago. Uh, urea 4600, 33% higher than a year ago. Potash 18% higher than a year ago. So all these fertilizer prices and the only way I can put it to you is they are just stupid. Um, and they, uh, uh, they are really, really causing some issues with folks trying to make some, make some plans in terms of what to do with these summer forages. So I guess here's, here's what I would, I would encourage you to do. Um, and there is a major difference between cutting cost and cutting corners. Uh, you may have heard us say that, say that phrase before, because there is a difference. Uh, so in terms of cutting costs, some of the things that I guess I would encourage you to to evaluate and you know, we can talk about this all day long, but if you don't have records and you don't have some things to compare year over the year, this is going to be pretty difficult for you to do. Uh, but if you do have some good records, you do have a way to compare year over year. Uh, some of these things may be able to help you. So in terms of uh, cutting costs, uh, deferring loan payments, uh, visiting with your lender. Uh, whoever that lender is, go visit with them, sit down, have a conversation with them, educate them a little bit in terms of what uh, what some of these input costs that you're staring at. Um, uh, try to defer payments. Uh, uh, try to defer interest payments. Um, and the only way to know if that's possible is to go have a conversation with that lender and, uh, and just plead your case. Um, and labor costs are a major issue across the board. So if you can 
if you can decrease some of those labor costs, um, um, try to do more of that labor yourself um, um, and just trying to eliminate some of that labor costs that uh, uh, that may be burdening you uh, or bogging you down. Um, equipment costs. We had a really good conversation and this is where I hope Lee and Vince will chime in uh, as we go through this. So um, new equipment uh, is ridiculous. Uh, so trying to defer new equipment costs uh, to a later date, uh, trying to um, put some of those costs into equipment repairs for the time being until we get out of some of this volatility in terms of these inputs. Um, uh, purchasing used equipment instead of new equipment. If you're just to the point to where that equipment purchase has to take place, uh, uh, going out there and really shopping around and sourcing some good used equipment uh, instead of going out there and purchasing, purchasing the bright, shiny new stuff. Um, uh, doing due diligence in terms of good animal husbandry practices to decrease veterinary costs. Um, um, and those are those are some of the things that we're talking about in terms of decreasing some of those input costs that you have instead of just making the knee jerk reaction looking at these fertilizer prices well i'm i'm just I, I can't do it i can't put out fertilizer i can't i can't justify that expense well where you're going to realize if you can justify that expense is whenever you get ready to sell that calf crop and your uh your calf sales uh, your calf pounds that you've normally marketed are down 50 60 pounds uh, because uh you did not provide uh, a proper nutritional product in terms of that stored hay to those cows um, um, and, and that's where you're going to feel it is whenever you get ready to sell that calf crop in terms of decreased weaning weights. Uh, so uh, I guess real quick Lee and Vince I'll, uh, uh, I'll let y'all pop in if y'all want to add something to that and uh, once once we've had that conversation a little bit then I'll move into the markets. Jason, I'm I'm only going to add one thing, and and that's my my grandfather. Uh, one of his favorite sayings was, uh, "You can gro you can go broke feeding a cow, but you can't starve a profit from one." And I know that's not of his own invention, but uh, it, it does ring true. Uh, you can't starve a profit from a cow, and that's not only speaking about nutrition. That's talking about mineral programs and internal parasite controls, other herd health aspects. Same goes with your, uh, you know, your hay quality when you're putting up this hay and that fertilizer is just so expensive and and everything and you're trying to weigh these decisions. Just keep in the back of your mind that cutting back on your fertilizer program, it, it may save you a little bit right now, but you're going to pay for it later on whenever you get to feeding that hay to cattle and it's just not quite enough to get them through and you wind up uh, having a supplement going into the winter a little bit heavier than what you normally would. So that's that's my two cents on the matter. Jason, if you would, I'll add, uh, you know, some of those cost cutting measures or, or cost saving measures, um, you know, cull cows, cows that need to come out the herd, um, you know, get them vaccinated, get them dewormed. Uh, if, if they're going to breed, get them bred. Uh, we, we had in our conversation earlier about what's going on in our local markets uh, that, you know, there's still some value to those those cold cows to some degree, uh, but you know, get get them out of your herd if they if they've missed a calf or two. Um, whether you like them or not, you can't fall in love with them. And uh, you know, Lee alluded to something his grandpa said, and I'll allude to something mine told me: good cows are not cheap, and cheap cows are not good. But uh, in today's world, um, if there's some, if you can get some added value out of a call, you need to get them going, um, and be cautious of of you know making those expenses uh, or expenditures. On replacement cattle, uh, I, I deal with a lot of a lot of different uh, levels of cow, cow producers, cow calf producers. Uh, we tend to want to uh, buy the fancier, shinier, uh, kind of like that new equipment, uh, the higher ended stuff. Uh, we, we really need to be watching our P's and Q's and our pennies here as we move forward uh, with the increased cost of fuel, fertilizer, and um, you know those those, those fancier cows are going to cost you more. And you really need to pencil it out in the bank and make sure that you can pay for them. In a, uh, in a in a reasonable time frame, uh, and the old saying goes that two and a half calves should pay for a cow, and 
in, in these days and times, if you're paying anything over, you know, sixteen or seventeen hundred dollars for a replacement heifer or a bred cow, uh, you're probably paying too much. So uh, we, we need to be real cautious about what we're spending on on replacement cattle and get those calls out of the herd uh, to save some money. Really good comments, guys. I appreciate that very much. Um, and as as Lee indicated earlier, reach out to us if uh, if you want to have a further discussion there. Please reach out to us. We'd be we'd be glad to visit with you and help you. Uh, moving into the markets, uh, the week slaughter volume of six hundred sixty nine thousand head uh, was uh, four and a half percent over the previous week, so a good improvement. Uh, that'll definitely uh, continue to help work into uh, that available supply of cattle. Uh, Saturday slaughter continues to be the one making up the difference. Uh, so daily slaughter has been down, uh, but uh, Saturday slaughter has been making up that difference in terms of trying to get that uh, that weekly slaughter up. Uh, choice box B cutout values finished the week nine dollars and eight cents higher at three hundred and twenty three dollars and fourteen cents a hundred. Uh, that is eighty five dollars and twenty five cents higher than a five year average. I'm sorry, Mr. Lee, that I had to put that in there. I know that uh, that does not make any of us happy, but uh, um, and uh, as we've said before, education, education, educate yourself about some of these things that are taking place. Uh, the Choice Select spread finished the week $23.23, which is $5.43 higher than the five-year average. So I would say at that $5.43, we're pretty seasonal on that uh, on what that spread is. So if you do that math uh, between three dollars and twenty three cents on choice cutout and the spread at twenty three, that should tell you that select cutouts are nine cents shy three hundred dollars a hundred. Uh, that is a astronomical price for select cuts. Catalan feed report released May twenty first was largely overshadowed by the positive slaughter report. Uh, cattle and calves on feed for the slaughter market in the United States for feedlots with capacity of 1,000 head or more totaled 11.7 million head on May 1st, 2021. Uh, that inventory was 5% above May 1, 2020, and the second highest May 1 inventory since the series began in 96. Uh, marketings of fed cattle during April totaled 1.94 million head. That's 33% above 2020. Uh, all things considered, the report indicates plenty of cattle available in the coming months with an overall decline in supplies indicated by the last several cattle on feed reports. So it's indicating that in the short term, we got plenty of supply out there. Uh, but uh, if you look at the, the overall trend of the last several cattle on feed reports, it does show that we do have a declining supply. However, uh, the common narrative over the last couple of days is since uh, since that cattle on feed report came out is that comparing 2021 and 2020 inventories maybe doesn't give us just a real accurate picture. Uh, so I'll give you a, a, a scenario. Uh, I had a banker call me uh, back. Uh, it's It's been a while back. It's probably been a year uh, over a year now. And that banker was looking at our price and production summary on calf prices in terms of an average of 2015 to 2019. So that's the average that I'm working off of right now. So if you remember what took place in 2015, the banker's question was, are my average numbers skewed because of prices that we pull into that average in 2015? Well, and that is definitely a pretty good argument. I mean, uh, we were bumping almost three dollars a pound on calves. I mean, it was uh, and it was that was some astronomical prices. Um, but uh, uh, so now what we're looking at in terms of comparing 2021 and 2020 this time of year is we were in the heart of a pandemic. Uh, so uh, maybe comparing those years together doesn't give us a real accurate picture. So if we step back and compare 2019 levels. Uh, then May 1, 2021 inventories would be down 0.7%. Uh, April 2021 feedlot placements were 127% a year ago placements. But again, if we compare them to 2019 levels, April 2021 placements would be 1.1% smaller. So, um, and I, I think it's important for us, again, educate yourselves about that. Uh, pay attention. Uh, we always have to pay attention to where we're comparing it 
uh, but um, I, I think if you if you take a step back and look at where we were in terms of 2019 and more of a and I use this term tongue in cheek normal year, um, then uh, uh, that might give us a little bit more picture of what we're looking at now. To close out the week in the five area feeding region, Fed steer negotiated cash sales ranged from 118 to 121, so that was steady to slightly weaker in the south. Uh, and steady to a dollar lower in the northern feeding regions. Uh, that was on a confirmed 68,287 head in terms of cash negotiated sales. Uh, most recent futures quotes showed August down 72 cents at 120.20, October down 62 cents at 124.42, and December down 47 cents at 128.12. Uh, five to 600 pound steers, medium and large ones and twos, so mostly steady at 143. Uh, so that was steady to $8 lower from the previous week. Seven to 800 pound feeder steers, medium and large ones and twos, sold between 119.47 and 125.05. So that was two to $7 lower from the previous week. Uh, overall, feeder cattle traded higher uh, after a mixed trade week, uh, early week. Uh, most recent quotes showed August trading up 50 cents at 154.20, September up 52 cents at 155.42, and October up 50 cents at 156.20. Lean coal cows remain steady from the previous week, uh, so they're still ranging in that 56 cents to 58 cents a pound. Uh, moving into our feedstuffs, uh, soybean meal down $27.70 at $439.30 a ton. Soybean hulls are steady at $155 a ton. Cottonseed meal is up $15 at $370 a ton. Whole cottonseed is steady at $385 a ton. Rice bran is steady at $140 a ton. Corn gluten feed meal, that's the 60%, is steady at $670 a ton. DDGs are down $2.50 at $240 a ton. And corn, so this is new crop, August, September, August to September delivery at Pine Bluff, down 39 cents a bushel at $4.49 a bushel. Um, with that, Ashley, appreciate the time, and I'll turn it back over to you. All right, thank you. Thank all of you um, for all that information. And I just want to point out, you know, again, reach out to us if you have questions on that. Each um, each operation can be different in how you can help to um, to save and to maximize your profits there. I also want to remind y'all too that you can always go back and look at some of our webinars that we've had before. Um, so just to point out a few that um, I think would be very beneficial that we've talked about today. Go back to our first one from April of last year, and um, that was sustainability in turbulent markets, um, especially Lee's part there on how to market, um, different ways to market your animals. Um, Lee and Jason's best management practices and forage harvesting from April of this year. Um, I think both of those are, are very timely and beneficial for y'all right now, but you can go back and you can find all of all of the ones that we've had so far. Um, on our YouTube channel, LSU Ag Center dash livestock. And if you have questions on any of those, just feel free to reach out to one of us for that. Um, with that, uh, the last thing that I want to mention is our webinar for next year or next month, excuse me, will be on June 8th with Mr. Tyler Bro. We have receiving strategies and management of high risk stalker calves. Again, June 8th um, at 10:30 a.m. We will be live, and as always, I will record that and get that posted for you that week. So we hope that you're able to stay dry. Um, as Lee mentioned, and I think Vince and Jason did as well, our hearts go out to all of you, um, particularly in the Lake Charles area, um, that are dealing with the flooding and I guess the, the aftermath of all of that. So we will be back with y'all in a couple of weeks. Thanks. <laughs>